I want to stay a little local too, uh, to Florida, specific to waste management, like um, some of the other folks were talking about. Uh, recycling, single stream recycling, C and D recycling, it's a, it's a uh, challenging time. We heard that all day today. But what I will say is that um, waste management has participated with many of you in this room on efforts to uh, share the difficulties and share the transparency that you even heard Mitch talking about earlier. We, we got a chance to speak with the folks at DEP last year around some of the challenges of recycling and they've already started their uh, efforts to help us uh, communicate that with some webinars and some future things starting to happen. So um, in, in kind of concepts with, with uh, partnerships, uh, I hope that we're doing our part as an organization and uh, want to do more of it. Um, and just for reference purposes, here in the state of Florida, um, we processed a little more than 550,000 tons of single stream recycling in the state of Florida last year. Um, and combined with Patty Hamilton, uh, we heard from earlier with the acquisition of uh, Sun Recycling, uh, expect to process a little more than 1.2 million tons of C and D materials uh, in 2016. So um, we're growing that business. Someone asked earlier, are we investing in Florida in recycling plants? And, and the short answer is no, uh, we aren't today. Uh, but we are a waste and recycling company. That's who we are. We do a little event out in Phoenix called the Phoenix Open, uh, the Waste Management Phoenix Open. It's a zero waste uh, a week-long event. We do a uh, executive sustainability uh, forum with with our with our competitors and our partners around the United States to talk about the challenges of recycling. So we're actively involved in it, and we intend to reinvest in it. But there's a model that needs to correct itself uh, before investment can take place in the private industry. So um, I'll talk a little bit about what's happened in single stream over the last uh, 10, 12 years. And I'll, I'll say this, when I, when, I, when I show this slide, this is the number of single stream facilities in, in North America. I think that's North America, it might be the United States. But that's not waste management facilities, that's across all of the processing facilities, both public and private. Um, that's come to an abrupt halt in the last two years because of what you heard about this morning. There, there's very few new facilities coming online that are offset that are not offsetting the ones that are closing uh, around the country. But what, what's in, what's unique to me about this slide is that in in the matter of 12 years, um, it's a relatively new industry. It's a relatively new processing understanding of the requirements, and that that's not just about the doorsteps of the MRF, uh, the processing center. But that's at the curb and inside the kitchens of our homes. That whole concept of single stream collection for ease of use is very valuable to someone if they use it properly. And I think what, what I can attest to with this kind of growth is it, it's an immature market. We've got work to do and I think we all recognize that. Um, and I think there's ways to succeed. Real, real uh, signs of hope with some folks making some efforts that you've heard about in this room today and some municipalities and some private sector in, in, in entities that are really involved in trying to find the solutions for this. Um, again, downward slide, this is a, 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 an average value of a single stream ton. Uh, Mitch, it's not far off from what your number was earlier, but when I look at this slide, what it tells me in, the, in literally five years, um, a steady decline. If you do that linearly, it's a decline. If you do it even when you look at the ups, ups and downs of it. And, and what, what we're cheered at messages, and you heard this morning, is it's not a blip in the pricing industry anymore. When recycling before 2011 um, was talked about, there was ebbs and flows, real highs and real lows, and they were really condensed, sometimes as three and six month time spans from the high to the low. So there was the, the concept of will, the willingness to, to stick it out, to continue to recycle because the pricing's gonna come back. This is beyond a blip. This is a five-year trend. Um, and when you think about all the in indicators you heard this morning, um, there really isn't going to be the significant uptick, maybe some slight upticks in certain commodities, but to think that we're gonna get to a, back, to a blended uh, stream of material back when we were in 2011 and the next five years, no one sees that today. No one can predict that. So there's no catalyst making that happen. It's kind of the inverse of that. You've got oversupply. You've got commodity pricings like, like, like oil and energy that are, that are depressed. And those things are keeping that commodity market from coming back. The red dotted line 
isn't far from waste management's national average of processing a, a ton of recycling, 78 bucks at the time we did this slide. Now, what I'd say to you about that $78, and, and Mitch attested to it earlier, is it depends on the inbound stream of your material. Does it have glass, does it not? Is it clean? Is it all recyclable? Is there a high non-recyclable content level in it? Does it have more plastics than fiber? Is it more container rich than it is fiber rich? All of those indicators change that $78 a ton. Um, the other thing I'll say is the quality of the facility you, you use to process it with. Um, it's going to change the cost of running that plant. Uh, it's going to change its capacity. Um, someone said earlier, I think from Lee County, was talking about capacity issues in the marketplace. Um, if, if waste management's facilities in Florida alone processed 10% better looking material that it received, uh, we wouldn't be in a capacity environment right now. Um, and it, and a place where material is designed to be separated and sold, we're handling material that can't be sold in large amounts of it. So it's something that we can all talk about and, and correct. Cardboard and newspaper pricing declines, blue and red is cardboard and newsprint. Uh, you know, these are all historical trends that just lead us down this path of what we're talking about. In, in Florida, waste management, the, the bar graphs are showing you the hundreds of thousands of tons processed uh, nationally um, in, in our plants. And then the line graph is the residue percentage. What you see by looking at that is an average of about 18% um, contamination. Okay? Contamination is material that is not necessarily MSW, but it's material that cannot be repurposed in its current state. It's, it's material that's not part of your curbside program. It's material that your trucks are picking up, you bring it to a processing center, you're having to spend time and money and effort on processing it, and you can't resell it. Um, so at 18%, and that's on the low end of some of the plants in Florida, um, but as a national average, you're looking at one out of every five trucks you're using to pick it up is full of non-recyclable material. If, if I look at plants, that's one of every five single stream plants constructed is processing non-recyclable material. When you think about that in that way, we've got work to do on the front end to make sure the material that's arriving at the plant can be resold. Whatever the price of the material is, it doesn't really matter at that point. You can inherently increase the price of your single stream ton by just removing the stuff in it that doesn't belong. Um, so I think that's pretty important. When I start talking about processing contamination, $125 a ton is on the low end. I mean, that really depends on how far you gotta take it, how many times you gotta touch it. And then you start asking your question, yourself questions about, did you really improve anything in the environment? Forget about economics. I've picked it up, I've, I've collected it and brought it to a MRF, I've processed it, I've taken the labor dollars and costs associated with processing it, I put it back in a truck and I drive it over to a landfill and I still threw it away. Did I do any good there? We have to look at that from a perspective of what, how does recycling need to work going forward. And I think there's real ways to fix that. Um, so big changes are, are coming, making us make these decisions. And I, I don't want to go through China's GDP and all that. We heard that this morning. But what, what does, what the last bullet there from a, when, when you have the, the demand low, uh, not only does it drive price down, it also puts pressure on the quality of the material you're selling. You've got to make a better product because the demand is lower. So it makes your cost level go up. And what we haven't seen in the industry yet, and we sure hope to see it from the, re, the, re, from the buyers, is that if we make a better product, we get a better price. Um, that hasn't happened yet. But what, what's really happening is we've, we're having to make a better product just to market material. So um, measuring to manage. So, we talked about what can we do, what can we do better. Um, one of the ways waste management's really taken some, some lead actions is inside the four walls of our facilities. So how do you run a facility better knowing what kind of inbound strain you're getting? Well, the first way to do it is to measure what you're doing. You can't read any of these numbers, and nor can I without glasses. But what I'll tell you is we, we study every minute of every plant's operation. We recognize when something fails, what caused it, to try to avoid it from happening again. These are manufacturing plants, guys. They don't run like a, 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 a truck route on the street. 
Uh, we have trucks, and many of them, I think 16 or 1700 in the state of Florida, right, Don? Uh, every one of my managers that runs a truck operation will tell you if his truck breaks down, he's got a spare truck. I'll tell you, there's no spare, spare Murph. When it breaks, 30, 40, or 50 people are standing around looking at each other inside that plant, and the material's still coming in off the curb. So when you think about, you know, potentially looking at doing this as a municipality or inside of a, of, of a condition where you've got a structure of trucks and you want to process your own material, recognize that there has to be some backup capacity for yourself. You can't be in a place where you're built something to process your current stream of material, knowing it's going to organically grow. More and more kids are recycling today. We, we teach them that, right? It's going to grow and it's going to break down. So you're going to have to have a backup plan. But we do that by managing minutes and seconds, not by looking at monthly figures. And, and we do that every day at every plant. The other thing we do is we kind of look at what it costs to maintain a facility. Uh, we talked about non-investment or non-reinvestment currently in our line of business, but you hear our leaders of our company nationally talk about, we're in this for our customers, and we are. We're not exiting the recycling market. We're trying to help you, and I'll use Mitch's term, show you the transparency of it, what, what it really means to be in the recycling business. Um, and what this will say is that after you invest, you spend millions of dollars, depending on how much you want to spend, it doesn't maintain itself. Uh, it's, this is a lot of technical equipment, a lot of moving parts. You're introducing a very foreign, unknown inbound stream to it. If you were at a legitimate manufacturing plant, you'd have conditions around what you're buying to put into that plant to make a product, right? You wouldn't, you'd, tolerance are there. Well, if I'm gonna build a, a yacht, I'm gonna know what the raw materials are that I'm getting to build that yacht. Out of MERV, I don't know what I'm getting from minute to minute. So you're going to have maintenance costs. Recognize how to man, manage that, how to maintain that. And, and at least for us here in Florida at Waste Management, um, we've shown a, a, an improvement on our maintenance costs. That, that downward decline line is actually a good one for <laughs> different than the most of the ones you've seen today. Um, so uh, just more statistics, but I guess getting to the solutions and, and this is going to line up, although Mitch and I didn't talk to each other before this meeting and I'm pretty sure we didn't even know we were going to be here together. Um, this is going to line up with a lot of things you heard him saying. Um, update the pricing models. You know, th this concept of, of making sure that there's shared responsibility in the price of that material. Um, Somebody said it earlier today, and I, I've, I've repeated it a couple of times. If I were to go ask some children in school if they'd pay somebody to, to recycle their material versus throw it in a landfill, every kid in that school and every household would tell you, I'd pay somebody to recycle it. Recognize there's a cost and recognize we're going to do the right thing when it comes to sharing in that cost. Invest in education. Everybody's talked about that, and I'll, I'll reiterate it. Um, and education is more than just telling someone to do something it's making sure they're following those rules. And that's probably as, as the most important takeaway from my message to you guys today is an education program includes enforcement, it includes compliance, it also includes a continuous effort through your entire recycling program. You don't just do it when you start a single stream program, you do it for as long as you continue doing it. So, and then transparency we talked about. Um, I'm not going to jump on the glass bandwagon yet. We do feel like there's a, there's a completely different cost related to glass. Um, and I'm not sure that right now we can attest to the fact that it should stay in the stream or shouldn't stay in the stream. What I'll tell you about it is once we understand how to, and there is equipment that will remove it, and in the private industry, it's very difficult to cost justify it based on the pricing of an improved glass stream versus not. So I'd say that glass still needs a lot of evaluation and it needs to be a partnership evaluation. We, we need to look at it and make sure that's exactly what you want to do. When I look at that graph that somebody showed earlier today, how much glass is in the, in the actual stream of diversion, it's not that big of a number. And it, to have it as part of your program and the damages it causes, I'm not sure it, out, it doesn't outweigh itself. I guess I see some nodding up here. So. Um, Ultimately, you know, let's make sure the contract language with your processing companies is fair for both parties. It, somebody said it, it's got to be a win-win. It can't be a one-sided agreement. No, one, one person's always not going to be happy. Um, identify the processing cost based on what you're delivering uh, to your, either your facility or your processors. Make sure you understand what the costs are 
and then continue to budget and have some responsibility around education. There's actual success stories in this state of counties and cities that are working hard at this, and you can see, uh, we can see it at our plants in the, in the ability to have a better stream of material. Um, but it takes the effort of those cities and folks there to help us do that. Um, waste management has a site. Uh, many of you probably heard it. I hope all of you have, but I'd point you to it. it. It gives you a lot of communication about recycling. It's called Recycle Off and Recycle Right. Um, it talks about uh, all things recycling, and it'll answer a lot of you know, questions that many of you probably have when it comes to specific things around recycling. Um, that's really all I had other than questions or comments. What would you say about the uh, recent proposals of one bin or, or what would you say about the recent proposals about one bin or solid waste and recyclable collection in one bin, so-called dirty immersed? Is that a crazy idea to you? On the surface, personally, it's a crazy idea. <laughs> I t I'll tell you what, there's, I, there's ways that can work. It's got to be from a perspective in a place where there's, there's a big cost of diversion away from the landfill. Generally speaking, that takes a lot of governmental interaction, uh, intervention, and some cost, co cost removal of that to, for that to work. It's why you see most of those plants in places like California and up in the places where there's heavy tax avoidance when you don't landfill material or burn it. Um, what I'd say about Florida is it makes it that much more difficult because of the climate we're in, um, this cost structure of the the network of um, class one facilities that both counties own and private sector owns. And I don't see that as a real success here in Florida right now. Um, there's technology out there that can do it. I mean, I think Birmingham tried to prove it. Uh, you could tell that economic model didn't work. It didn't sustain. Uh, but it's, it's got to be in the right place economically for it to work. <laughs>